Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Cole, for that very warm and heartfelt introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to begin this afternoon by sharing with you some of my own photographs, but um, I'll also be showing work by other artists. And I wanted to kind of shift the conversation um, just a little bit, um, or maybe a lot. We've been talking about searching for our roots and how we go about searching for our roots, especially in the 21st century, when we have at our hands some of the amazing research, some of the amazing scientific work um, that we've, we've heard um, today from our specialists. Um, but I think in addition to um, DNA testing, uh, and also in addition to uh, looking at how science has been able to help us search for and sometimes find our roots, um, many diasporic Africans have traditionally um, chosen to search for their roots by engaging in heritage tourism. And um, I've done for about the past 15 years um, a number of different studies on African diasporic heritage tourism, particularly to Ghana. And I think often, and I'm showing you here in the first slide, an image um, from the distance of Elmina Castle, um, a castle fort, com fort fortified complex that was built by the Portuguese um, in 1482 on the coast of, of Ghana. And um, this slide here is of uh, Fort Good Hope. Um, and as many of you may or may not know, but the coast of Ghana is lined with forts and castles um, built by uh, the European traders um, with assistance from uh, local Africans um, in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and so on. Um, and these forts are places that have symbolic and historic meaning um, for many of us. And so in searching for our roots, um, often diasporic Africans have sought to actually go to some of these sites, um, to look at, in these sites, to search in records in places um, like Ghana, for example, or even Senegal um, for their roots. But they're often looking in these actual physical places that we see. And one of the things that's important to consider, and as we look at the photographs, realize that um, life goes on, that these forts and so-called castles are not just places that relate um, only to the history of the slave trade, but in fact, there are people living, um, fishing, working. Um, there are actually many people who are artists um, on the coast um, who are very much attuned to this tourist trade and attuned to making works that are available for sale that help to feed into these narratives of how we construct our past if we, for the, for, on the one hand, don't have the um, the benefit of DNA research, or even if we do have the benefit of DNA research, we're trying to affirm that research or perhaps search for a, a different finding. And in the image that I'm showing you here, we have a young man who is an artist. Um, he lives in Elmina, and he's done a series of works uh, where he's uh, painted the exterior of Elmina Castle. It's a pretty familiar exterior. And in the series here, he has two different versions that he has for sale. This one is called The Revenge of the Blacks, where he has a, a group of African men who were taken as a coffle, um, trying to be taken by Europeans as a coffle into uh, this, this uh, fortified castle, Elmina, here. But instead, they are able to escape and, and defend themselves and get away. The flip side of this image that he also sells is one where they're taken in, and um, they are taken in, and, and they don't uh, actually get away. So we have tourist art that we see available for sale. And of course, there are conversations that go on between people who come again and again as tourists, but also I like to call them pilgrims. These are people who are searching for their roots, but who often make it a practice of going to Africa, going to different places in Africa, sometimes the same place, sometimes often Ghana again and again, because it's a pilgrimage where they go to visit these sites and where they go to visit families and places that have become um, their reclaimed home. They are, in a sense, returning um, home. And so we see here um, in Elmina Castle one of the interiors of uh, one of the dungeons um, and a group of tourists from uh, NYU. Um, this was a, a group that I was with in 2005 uh, with NYU and a tour guide. Um, this is, of course, one of the most um, uh, uh, personal spaces, I think, that we all experience in uh, the castles and on the tours. Um, but I'd like to also talk about this idea um, that I've written about called symbolic possession of the past. 
and symbolic possession of the past, not only in the work of visual artists, people like Romare Bearden. I'm showing you work um, here by Romare Bearden called Roots Odyssey from 1972 that he makes on the occasion of the first televised miniseries, Roots, um, wherein artists um, of African descent and their allies, um, as well as heritage tourists, engage in a type of symbolic possession of the historical past. They embrace the symbols. Um, it might be the architecture of, of Ghana, the architecture of the forts and castles of Ghana. It might be the symbolic image of the slave ship that I've been writing about. Um, and they embrace these symbols in such a way as to find a way to understand their way of being and their place in the present, how they've come to be part of an African diaspora. They embrace these symbols in a ritual fashion and artists like Bearden and others that we'll see have used this image of the slave ship. And I'm showing you um, one of the very first uh, uh, imprints of this image that was uh, made by a committee at Plymouth in the UK in 1789 to protest um, the abominable state of the slave trade and in fact to try to bring an end to the slave trade in England. This image that you see here in detail um, showed small figures representing the enslaved. And it was the first time that in the UK, and it was distributed around Europe and also in other places in the United States as well by 1790, that people could actually see in the inside of the slave ship. And that's how this image became so very impactful. To many of you today, it might be something that might seem somewhat commonplace, but for many of those in the late 18th century, it was actually quite a horrific image. It was also important, too, because in this particular uh, version here, a broadside or a poster called Description of, of Slave Ship that was published by the London Committee of the Abolition Society in 1789, it actually shows seven numbered sections and figures so that you have an architectural plan, one that enables you to uh, imagine a schematic in a space in which people are crowded inside of um, a slave ship that is going across uh, the Atlantic Ocean for a period of, of seven to nine weeks um, during the Middle Passage. And in this description that you see here, it's not just a, a graphic um, uh, in, a representation, but Additionally, you have a description with the amount of space that's, that's allowed for each individual who's on the, on the ship by uh, male, female, boy, and girl. Um, also, the kinds of uh, uh, health conditions that were available on the ship as well. And this is an image that was distributed in the hundreds of thousands by the end of the of the, uh, of the 18th century to the point where it really was the leading graphic image to end the slave trade. And by the 1850s, um, when they had the British uh, patrols along the coast of West Africa, a, a painter and a, a, a sailor named Maynell, who was part of one of those patrols, captured a ship and on the ship was able to paint from life in watercolor the conditions below the hold of the slave ship. So when I talk about symbolic possession of the past, I talk about this idea of repetition, artists repeating um, the same image over and over again, but to really try to come to a different understanding of what that image might mean at a different point in time. And here I show you in 1928, 1928 the Mexican artist Miguel Covarrubias who's designed the end papers of a book called uh, The Adventures of an African uh, Slave Trader um, that's republished in 1928 um, using, again, this iconic image. And he's also using the language of art, of art history um, in 1928, where you can see um, the sort of modernist shape that he gives to the figures that he has representing um, the enslaved in the slave ship icon. By 1969, Malcolm Bailey, who was the first uh, African-American artist to premiere um, at a gallery named Cinque um, after the leader of the Amistad Re Revolt um, in New York City in 1969, this gallery was opened by Ernest Critchlow and uh, Romere Bearden and Norman Lewis, prominent um, artists in New York City, um, to showcase the work of young black artists. Bailey decides to, again, return to this image to um, think about this moment in 1969. If you can think about the Black Power Movement, and you see in his version, which is very much almost a blueprint image, 
he includes blacks and whites um, in the boat at the same time, making a comment about the relationship um, economically between um, blacks and whites in 1969. Also in the same year, um, we have um, uh, Amiri Baraka, um, known as, uh, previously known as Leroy Jones, who um, does a play called Slave Ship, uh, and it's a play that is based on um, the history of the transatlantic slave trade and about African-American culture and African-American history, but he uses um, the diagram of the slave ship, and I'm showing you here, um, the stage design to create a theater in the round where everyone in the audience is implicated um, by this schematic space, and anyone in that audience could be sold to uh, someone, or anyone in, in that audience could have been taken advantage of physically, as many people were um, on the slave ship during the Middle Passage. If we progress um, into the late 1970s, Bob Marley uses the image again on the album cover, uh, Survival. And then we see also by the 1990s and the 2000s, um, Hank Willis Thomas on the right-hand side sort of co-ops and adapts um, an absolute vodka ad um, and transforms it into um, thinking about absolute power. We can also think about how um, in present day, when many of us are thinking about the struggles, particularly in the American prison system and the protests against the prison industrial complex, how in this work here um, on the left, too soon for sorry, um, the plan of the slave ship is also crisscrossed with um, the plan for uh, an actual prison, um, a present day prison. Hank Willis Thomas has also taken this image and done a series of credit cards and thinking about the relationship, again, an economic relationship to the history of the slave trade and the black male body in particular. You can see the imprint and some of the other icons of this history um, that we see and the implications, again, on the scarred body. And another work here, his Afro-American Express, um, uses in graphic form um, these very small figures aligning um, uh, the perimeter of the card itself. Um, many artists um, have thought about, again, the transatlantic voyage of the Middle Passage, Deborah Willis, um, Hank Willis Thomas's mother, we've spoken about her earlier um, in, in this conference, um, has worked in uh, fabric in, for many, many years, um, and this is one of her quilts. Um, wherein she found actually a piece of fabric that had these line drawings in the background um, of a French uh, slave ship and then used historical images um, of sail signs and also coffles to make a, a print, uh, or rather a quilt, um, about the transatlantic slave trade. And then a work that um, I think is really, really interesting, um, it's worn here in this photograph by uh, David Driscoll, um, uh, the venerable African-American artist and um, art historian at the University of Maryland. Um, he had a jeweler in Hyattsville uh, make this, uh, this uh, bracelet here that you can see that has this main um, iconic image um, here on his wrist. Um, many artists, um, including Willie Cole, have thought about the relationship between the shape of this icon, and we can talk about icons and shape, um, and the type of labor that women have done, particularly through um, women's and domestic work and the ironing board. And this is a work by Willie Cole entitled Stowage, um, where he actually uses the printing process um, to create a very large scale um, work using an ironing board. And then works here by Marionetta, uh, Mar Marionetta Porter, um, who was a fellow here at the Smithsonian some time ago, um, has also used vintage uh, ironing boards, again, to kind of think through this image, um, again, with her relationship to women in her family. And many artists are using this, this, this image um, to talk about, um, again, the relationship to the diaspora, becoming part of the diaspora, but also to tell familial stories as well. And then Betty Saar, um, a noted artist, once said when I interviewed her about her use of the slave ship icon because she has, again, in many different instances in ritual form uh, used this work. And that's another part of this idea of symbolic possession, thinking about the ritual possession that um, we can think of in certain kinds of ritual performances. She said that, you know, for me, it's a part of my DNA. That's what she said in the interview. I didn't pull it out of her for the conference, but she said, I feel that it is a part of my DNA. 
Um, another image that I wanted to share with you, which might be another familiar image, is um, an image from Gori Island in Senegal, another very, I think, in terms of thinking about the familiar images of the west coast of Africa, of places that we might associate with the transatlantic slave trade, with one way in which um, we might think about a formation of the African diaspora is this, this very symbolic and historic image of the door of no return, uh, photographed by many, including uh, Carrie Mae Weems, a contemporary artist who has a retrospective traveling around the country now. And this is one of her works from that series that she did in Ghana in 1993. Um, another artist, too, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, um, has photographed, uh, rather, has done photography, but also installation art where she's utilized the slave ship icon to think about the way in which African religious traditions were uh, re transformed but also retained in the New World. And in this work, um, in English and in Spanish, she says, let us never forget. This is called the seven powers, referring to the seven powers, Yoruba powers, that were translated into Santeria. Um, the seven powers come by the sea. And you see the figures there representing the seven powers. Um, a work by Keith Piper, a black British artist. It's an image, this uh, image here of the slave ship, one that really travels like the slave ship did um, around the, the, the black Atlantic. Um, and this, in this work, a ship called Jesus, um, he uses the imprint in a multimedia form. Similarly, in a church um, in Chicago, the New, pa New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church, um, a rose window was remade using um, a very famous work by Tom Feelings from his book, Middle Passage, in the central um, part of the figure um, that's a risen Christ figure with the words remembrance around the rose window. And we return here to Cape Coast Castle to think about the meaning of the, 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 the middle passage and also the meaning as well of the door of no return the way in which this site has been marked in more contemporary times, particularly since about the mid-1990s, wherein it has been transformed into an international site um, where many, many diasporic Africans travel, and others too from around the world, where it has been marked as memorial, um, and where, as we see in this last uh, set of slides, the door of no return has been renamed the door of return. Thank you very much.